Brian, I mean, you've been through so much. None of us really wanted to talk about it, what we had gone through. We all wanted to forget about it. And we're going to talk about your extraordinary bravery and what you've been through since. Wanted to deal with it how I wanted to deal with it, which was just shut up shop and take it on the chin. But even if I didn't want to talk about it and the soldiers didn't want to talk about it, there were plenty of people who did. We were British soldiers. We were sent to war to do what we'd been told to by politicians, only to then come back and find ourselves fighting another battle, this time to clear our names. Mr Speaker, it has been confirmed that British soldiers did not carry out the atrocities that have been falsely attributed to them. There's that quote from Churchill about how a medal glitters, but it also casts a shadow. This is case in point. The shine has gone, lost in the shadows of the accusations that followed. Brian, how are you, brother? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. And uh, thanks for having me on. Appreciate no. it. I mean, we've, tr we've been trying for a while now, so it's good to get on. Yeah, we seem to be um, passing ships, uh, like I'm with a lot of my guests on social media. We're, at, we're out there and doing our stuff, and uh, when we finally get together, it's, it's all good, huh? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going to start by asking, where do you get your drive from, Brian? We'll probably come on to talk about everything that you've been through, which, which is enough to, you know, tread down 10 men, if not 100. Um, but you're so busy all the time. You, get, you seem to get so much done. Is there any philosophy we can learn from there? Do you know what? I'm not the oracle. And, uh, I'll, and I'll never claim to be someone uh, who thinks they are. I'm just driven by um, hard work. I think, you know, we're very privileged to, to be here. I'm very privileged to have what I've got with a very loyal wife and a loving family. And, and my drive to success really is for my family if i'm if i'm honest it's um clearly i've got goals and i really try to achieve each goal that i set out to do and if i can't then i'll really pull on the lessons uh, that i've learned throughout trying to achieve whatever goal or mission that i set out to achieve uh, and i've you know and i have failed in a few um but i've looked at it pulled out or extracted some key learning points and, and gone again. So, you know, there are so many people out there who are driven, who are motivated, who inspire me. And um, it's very infectious because I see this sort of same people in similar arenas to, to what I am, whether it be in business or whether it be in sort of my uh health life because i do try and keep myself um fit I, I try and set myself challenges and but i'm inspired by other people um who are doing their thing as well so i'm grateful for some of the messages i get sent um that people look at me as a little bit of an inspiration which is very flattering because i'm just a normal dude you know just trying to do my thing to try and keep the family afloat to try and stay ambitious to keep on um the, the plan you know i think most people do have a plan on where they want to be in three to five years time and and i just try not overwhelm myself with the pressure which comes with that because i'm well aware i can only i can only control the now and the present day i don't know what's around the corner tomorrow so there's no point trying to you know achieve too much just one day at a time Stick to the plan and let's try and achieve so yeah long-winded answer but like I said I'm just a normal guy it's not a short-winded question though mate is it and I I know it must be the center of your life as it is the center of mine is trying to use our experiences to make a go of it now yeah and there's a billion and one points we could draw out of this that I think are just fascinating for everybody who's 
you know, wants to own their life, basically. But one of them is like there's that old school thing where you put the hours in, isn't it? You know, you work mm. and then you work and you do the 18 hour days and you get up and you work. And that's kind of clashing now with with the more sort of lifestyle orientation. Definitely. You know, definitely. Spend time and, with your kids while they're young. Yes. You know? Yes. And do you know what's really, do you know what put that into perspective for me? Lockdown. 100%. That is a true, huge positivity that's come out of the last 11 months, 10, 11 months for me is there is so much more to life than, than business, than my self goals and being driven. And we absolutely should maintain that. But what really is important, and I'm only speaking on behalf of Woody, is the family have got to fit into that so much more now. Because for me, they were the ones that were constantly here for me when I was going through some real tough times when I was head on with adversity trying to figure it out how can I get up in the morning how can I take another step forward and, and feed in everything that I was going through the people that were there were my family mm. you know I've just gone on, an, on an, an incredible journey with my oldest who will have his bags packed and off on his journey to become a paratrooper now he starts um the first two weeks of next month and we've just trained together most days i've tried to give him a steer without not getting involved too much but just being there for him if he needs me testing him in the physical arena and uh and just trying to make him uncomfortable now and again to make sure that he's got a little bit of understanding what resilience feels like what pressure feels like and actually your body is an incredible, you know, system that can go that little bit extra when needed, but it's down to you to fulfill that. So I've gone on this brilliant journey. Also, it's reconnected us because my military, like so many um, career, it, you know, kind of had an effect with our relationship because I was away so much. If I wasn't on ops, I was training. I wasn't training, I was on course, you know, and in that era, we were fighting two simultaneous wars with Iraq and Afghanistan. So I was bouncing from theatre to theatre, then training. So this last 10 months for me is, you know, just revitalising our bond and, and getting amongst it. And yeah, we've, it's been great. So yeah, it's really important for, for me now to figure out how I maintain that life balance because it is now massively factored into the business plan. Mm. It's key. Do you have any sort of key rules? Like, do you turn your phone off at a certain time of, in the evening or, or do you have set hours? Do you, do you try and wake up early? I think waking up early is in the, in the, the military gene, I think. I mean, it's so drilled and we've come from this institution where you're up there's no snooze button and you're just getting amongst it but and i'll tell you what we did we had um and that's a bit random but we had a lazy spa for a while during the first lockdown as we were going into it and the weather was really nice and i thought do you know what we were all we were always in there and it was the first time we were having real good conversation no phones just in the lazy spa and we were just talking about all sorts and it was just really nice to have this kind of real family time and uh, without any gadgets. So I thought I'm going to get a um, I'm going to get a hot hot tub because we used the lazy spa, which was a trial period. I wasn't going to spend you know money on this the you know, kind of materialistic items if we weren't going to use it, and it was just going to be a gadget. It needed to be money well spent. So I I did. I committed. We got it and. What we do is we have dinner as a family. And then once we've tidied up, we all go into the, uh, the hot tub and that's our time. So we, we make time. Yes, around the dinner table is very important, 
and um, and we have conversations. But our release time is definitely chilling in the hot tub, and sometimes if it's with a beer or a glass of wine, and and we have a conversation with with, with the boys because well, Bailey around the corner is off, and uh, we won't see him as much anymore. And then Charlie's not far behind him. God knows what he's going to do, but it's really important to create them really intimate moments because you know we know how fast time goes and yeah we're just about to wave away our our oldest boy so yeah it's important gosh so much to say there as well this whole tablet you know phone thing is it's a big thing and it there's something about it that's just so ugly. Um, just the notion that a family, and, and, and I'm not judging anyone here because you see your, your own family slipping into that. You, you look up and all three of you are on, on your blooming device. And um, Let me just turn it off, Chris, two seconds. There we go. That's good. Go on. Yeah, it, it's... We're letting time slip away on, on a false, you know, on a false engagement, i.e. the internet, as opposed to what you've just said, real, real family time. Yeah. And I think, you know, for, for me, I'm a realist and it's not going to get, it, the, digital is only going to be more improved, more innovative. So we have to learn to adapt with that. Um, it's it, it has a great purpose so it has its downfalls because of just the basics getting the engagements going having conversation you know paying attention to the conversation instead of you know it's it's a drug isn't it it's, it's a it's you you're there and you're picking up all the time it's forever it's it's like a weapon system it's always in an arm's distance away from you because it's a habit but also people rely on it for for their jobs whether it if they're on e-commerce you know i have my job it's it's run off the internet basically it's you know my, my keep attacking apparel is all done from that platform so it it i have to spend time on that and um and it's not me constantly on social it's actually it's what brings the money into the household so yeah, it's, it, I have to, and like other people, learn to live with it, um, accept it, but you can still have ground rules. You can still have rules which encompass your family values, which is, you know, whether or not it can be anything, but the bottom line is you try and make time for one another without devices. And ours is, is in the hot tub. Mm. how is your your can i call it in a parallel business that's not being rude is it no it's a yeah it's a sports and lounge apparel um it's doing really well chris um and i you know i say that being humble it really has taken off and i think the reason why it's gone like it's gone is because so many people can relate to it so many people can relate to the mantra as in keep attacking, it has a sublimal meaning, one that is very personal and unique to the individual. It states in chaos or in calm, no matter what you're experiencing, if you're willing to show up and keep attacking each day, it will surpass. And so many people have got their own journeys through adversity. It's, it's not just me. Life, life is at one point, will draw up some real challenges because it's the beauty of life. Life is stunning, but it's a demand. And it's how you adapt to adversity. It's, it's how you try and um, yeah, conquer what you're going through. And it's difficult. And I think people can relate to it in the way that it's either helping them get through cancer, which I've had messages from. There's someone has a big board in their kitchen called Project Keep Attacking. And it's Monday to Sunday. It basically, is, there's a timeline of you know, pills, appointments, physio, fitness, the, what, what they eat. And their project is called Keep Attacking. And 
it's really emotional because when I read these messages, it's just I'm so proud because when I before I launched it, I wanted to so the logo um, of Keep Attacking is I wanted it to be personal to the family, so it's the W in my surname, but the mantra I wanted it for everyone to use, you know, because I I knew. I didn't know, I thought people would connect with it, but then it just went. And the messages, like I said, I was receiving. So I've had messages from mums and dads saying it's really helping their kids um, inspire and have foresight in their sports and wanting to really achieve because they know talent alone is not enough. They really have to you know, squeeze that 5%. And having keep attacking on their BMX helmets is helping them do that. And I'm thinking, that's brilliant. You know, someone in hospital going through their blood. So there's doing their transfusions and wearing their keep attacking hoodie or T-shirt, you know, because they're, they're on a recovery or they're going through the thick of it within cancer. They, they, they can't give up. They need to try and overcome this and beat this. And it's really helping them do that or if you're recovering you know it's fine you can you, you, we all go through a recovery stage whether it be injury or whether it be through trauma or through drug addiction if you can recover you can still wear that mantra absolutely you know because you're showing up every day you're drawing back them curtains and let a little bit of light in which sometimes are very hard to do and if you can throw a t-shirt on which gives you that extra two percent to then get downstairs and then, you know, crack on with your day, then it's achieved its aim. So for me, the message, the clothing's a byproduct to the message and people just want to feel it and, um, and get it on and get out and they're running. And I've created a, just a really strong community that people just get it. And it's, um, it's going from strength to strength. And I'm just, I'm really proud of it. You know, I, I, I launched it with zero money with huge risk but my hard workout worked the risk for me and uh it's it's definitely paid off so i'm i'm really chuffed and pleased yeah you've done well mate congratulations what about the the day-to-day running of that kind of business do you i mean i've got my books on my website and to be honest it's for someone who's got admin as bad as me (laughs) <laughs> or, or it's not that my admin's bad it's like I like doing certain things and I, others I'm just I will procrastinate but when an order drops in I'm like oh god <laughs> I know I know sorry folks it's a terrible attitude to have but but I mean are you kind of it it takes a lot to pack all that stuff and send it out and then you've got if the size doesn't fit and the person sends it back do you have to do all that yourself or are you you work every yeah. day when someone else does that for you? No, this is, I'm in Keep Attacking HQ now. So this is our headquarters and my spare room's all racked out. And uh, I got to the point that I needed to employ someone. So I said to my wife, Lucy, you've got to come and work for me. I just can't keep up with everything, really. I can't do it on my own. So Lucy was the first employee for Keep Attacking. And um, she, if I'm honest, she runs the show. She runs the shop. She does the customer service to an exceptional standard. We have to deal with returns. It's nature of the business that I'm in. You know, if people, if it doesn't fit or people don't like it, it's fine. You know, it's be courteous and kind. And we continue to do what we do best and with our values intact. So it's, yeah. I needed a support, needed help. And I'm, I'm glad that, you know, Lucy can come in and, and take ownership of that. And it's given her a great purpose. She's really passionate and embedded within the brand. So, yeah, we're going strength to strength. And uh, hopefully soon we are going into a location uh, that we can really start to, to grow, scale up and do it properly because this kitchen it served its purpose and uh, it's now, you know, it's leaking, you know, there's boxes behind me on the floor there. It's, it's kind of leaked to, to within the household. And, and also, like we said before, I have to find a fine line with work and family life. And I feel working from home when everything is in my house, I can't escape it. 
it's just too easy to go up and crack something out here. Like, a, you know, 2,300 hours, there's an order what comes in. I'll struggle to leave that. And I know it needs to be fulfilled. So it's easy to do that. And actually, you shouldn't. It should be like your normal working hours. It's definitely difficult because at the moment, I'm eating, sleeping, keep attacking, which is brilliant because I'm really passionate about it. And I can I know where I want it to go to, but I have to figure out that fine line. And that's what hopefully we're going to be doing in the next sort of month or two, moving out of here and going into a location. It all seems really uh, promising, mate, doesn't it? Um, it's it's a bit like the the no fear. Do you remember the the no fear logo? Yeah, yeah. Sort of brand. Yeah, and yeah. That was those yeah. two words. Even though it's probably worn by people that were terrified most of the time, <laughs> it's you know, yeah. They, it's just a winner winner, isn't it? Um, I see the same for keep attacking. It's just it 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 sounds timeless. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, look, I don't know where it's going to go to. I know that it's had really good organic growth. I haven't done overly um, a lot on marketing, advertising. That comes into phase two, which we're going to sh shortly be going into. And uh, just the, the organic movement traction that it's had, I think yeah people are really getting a hold of it and thinking this is just really it's just a great two words to to have on you know because if i'm not gonna attack my business and try and do the best for it or attack this illness that i'm going through or you know in that sporting arena the extreme sports arena the boxing arena you know there's it's endless for that mantra to go and that's what I need to do as well, is not get carried away. Just keep it reined in a little bit um, and then just kind of hit different elements. I mean, the military has been a great connection because what a, what a mantra for the military as well. You know, I'm, I'm from a frontline um, uh, arena myself. So a lot of lads who, you know, are still serving, they're like, Woody, ping is over some kit, mate. This is quality, like, for what we're about and, and our day-to-day -day job is to get go on the offensive you know we know the best form of defense is going on the offensive action and and to attack and it was born from my backstory like I said but everyone's got their own journeys um within their life so it's just really related so what, that... watch this space basically yes so Brian was it hard for you then to go we'll we'll probably best to do this in, in a bit more of a chronological order um but i'm guessing the 10 years when you were subjected to these false uh, claims there wasn't an awful lot of attacking you could do other than to just keep keep true to your story was that or keep true to the to the facts yeah keep true to my values and what i stood for and my integrity which was a daily reminder but where Keep Attacking came in was I showed up every day. Some days I didn't fancy it. Some days were tougher than others. You know, when it went in, when the allegations of murder, mutilation and mistreatment after everything that we had done, you know, on, the, on that day of the 14th of May, which was the Battle of Danny Boy and being 23 as a young commander, making some huge decisions and, you know, I'm not the only person in the military which have had to make some real demanding, punchy decisions at that age. However, not everyone went through the aftermath of all of that. And um, so it was very tough to, to continue um, moving forward. I constantly reminded myself that everything's going to be okay. Even though, you know, I was kind of, we were left to get on with it on our own there was no ring of steel around us there was no phone calls of support that's both within the mod and also the british army i know i i find it hard to criticize the british army because i've got a love affair with them i mean it's definitely shaped me made me the person i am today 100 percent. but i highlight in my book 
that they did get it wrong. The duty of care was shocking. And it really, it hurt me because I was prepared to give my life for the British Army in a heartbeat. And to not have anything in return when I say this a lot, that I felt that I was fighting a harder battle on UK soil, on my home soil, than I was in foreign fields, punching it out every single day in, in 2004. You know, it was, um, it was sad. Um, but that's why I was so vocal about it. And, yeah, know, it, it took from, from 2009, when the allegations um, were made public, because it became a public inquiry, 34 million pounds of taxpayers' money went into this inquiry. And um, it was, yeah, it was such a roller coaster of emotions. It was draining. But, you know, I was, I was willing to, to go that distance and I was fatigued. Mm. There was many down days, but I got there in the end. And when we were found, well, it was Phil Shiner, the, the public interest lawyer, was found guilty on 12 accounts. It was um, deliberate lies, reckless speculation and ingrained hostility. And it was all to do with money and greed but the government allowed this witch hunt to, to go on and, and hurt people. You know, it was human life that they were, they were torturing. You know, it ended people's careers early. I'd done 17 years. And uh, once the summary hearing came out, after spending three and a half hours in the dock, getting questioned, getting everything that I'd stood for stripped back and um, felt like I was worthless, really. Everything that I stood for and, and did as a, a British soldier and a, and a human being, they just stripped me of everything, and um, it was tough. But when the when the um, when the summary hearing came out, I needed to go on the offensive. I needed to then attack and write about it, speak about it, the injustice, the corruption, the lack of support, not to hurt people to raise awareness and to try and make change. And recently, you know, we've had that oper the new operational bill go through, um, headed up by Johnny Mercer. And that wasn't because of me by any stretch. However, I did show up above the parapet. I went in to have a number of meetings. I was on a, a panel um, on lawfare with the biggest influencers within the British Army, whether it would be American, you know, commandants or British brigadiers you know I was one of few, a few on that panel to to say you know we have to protect if British soldiers get it wrong or marines or airmen or anyone in that you know arena and they get it wrong they need to be punished however if British soldiers aren't getting it wrong and doing the right thing how are they still being allowed to be punished it's just it's it's beyond me so we have to have something put in place where a statute of limitation or a law is changed, I don't know. British soldiers or the British Army or the military as a whole organisation aren't above the law. And I say this regularly. We have to adhere to the law. We're educated on it. We understand rule of law. You know, we understand rules of engagement. But when soldiers are in extreme environments and are getting it right, but still allowed to be dragged over the coals for years and years later. It's unacceptable. So that's why I just went on the offensive with the interviews that I was doing, um, you know, the, the, the book that I wrote, and then you know, the film, you know, is around the corner. So yeah. that's also highlighting it. So, yeah. It's such a... It's an area, isn't it, where there isn't always either like a simple answer or a simple way of being or, or a simple viewpoint that, you know, if you ask someone, should I run over a child in my car, unilaterally, if that's the right word, or universally, you're going to get no, not, not, that's not good, right? That's kind of like agreed. But when we go to war, 
an acts are committed, even if the act might be despicable and completely wrong, you're going to get a number of spectators that go, oh, no, that's fine. It's war or, or and, and sometimes that's that's a justified um, like response. Other times it's like, well, no, it might be war, but there's still like some semblance of rules there. Um, it was a bit like the Al Blackman thing. I, I'm guessing that you kept a, a, kept a, an eye on that when it was going on. Um, very, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's not always black and white anyway, Brian, is it? No, it's not always black and white. I mean, war is brutal. War is confusion. War, war will have an imprint on your life for the rest of your life. It's challenging. Um, and like I said, it, ha has, it has a, a lasting print. And I, I think mine and ours work are very different. Um, you know, when you actually dissect it, and I don't really, it's not my place to get into uh, you know someone else's story because I don't know the ins and outs of it but we it is two different um areas for sure but when and I can relate it to when I was in the courtroom and I was getting hounded by lawyers who had no credibility to me and I don't and that's not as a disrespectful statement to any lawyers because they're very good in their arena you know doing what they do but they didn't no on the elements of the battlefield they don't consider what had been leading up to the 14th of may what how many casualties we had taken you know throughout that tour um how many times we were getting smashed by the enemy daily hourly you know all of this is a lead up yeah and and definitely has a part to play in your mental state as well. It really does. It has a huge effect you know, to, to the point of chronic burnout, really. But they don't want to know that. They're not interested. So when, when they're asking me questions, I'm trying to create, with my answer, under all of this pressure, because I've never been to court before, I'm trying to, you know, paint them a picture, give, put things into context. You know, I was 23 young Lance Corporal at the time, and then years later, I'm in the courtroom, which I've then gone through my military um, command courses. So I'm educated a lot better as well. So I can you know, stand up there and try and find that fine balance. But it was, it was so difficult for me to do that under the pressure that I was under as well to, to answer these questions and let these people know that I'm not the person they, they think I haven't murdered anyone in cold blood. I haven't cut any limbs off or ears off or noses or fingers off and i haven't certainly mistreated anyone in, in any way um not on purpose i mean they said that my act of mistreatment was not giving some of the prisoner of war on the on once the real had been called there was nine pows there was 20 killed militia fighters killed and nine pows taken and on the way back to our forward operating base i never give any of the paws any water because we had a three quarters of a bottle left we were it was red hot we'd just been out in this huge battlefield for three and a half hours so i was going to drink that water and some of some of my lads you know apparently that was the wrong thing to do because i was inhumane by not giving them water plastic cuffs when we arrested them it was said that we put the plastic cuffs on too tight. You know, they should be whatever degree angle. And it's, you know, and they, that they were just like some of the questions that were highlighted, which they put at me being inhumane. And there was a few bruises on someone's face or, and, you know, yeah, there was. Because when you're conducting trench warfare, which hasn't happened for God knows how many years, You've just launched a full frontal, you know, counter attack on this dug in position that have tried to kill you. They've gone, they've initiated it. 
they're all set up on an ambush and we've countered it with a lot less manpower on the ground than what they've got a lot less well i wouldn't say firepower because we had our armored vehicle support but you know th- th- there's going to be aggression there's going to be you know that hard fast tempo and it was you know we had to go in and re- arrest and restrain people these people have tried to kill us so we've had to let these people know these militia fighters know who's in charge you know and if there's a couple of punches thrown then then that's what happens in them they were still alive you know there was still nothing wrong with them they were just made sure that they we, we were in business and it was us that had control of this whole situation what did they expect i tell you what they didn't expect us to get out of that vehicle and launch a counter attack on them they never expected that for one minute and when we started to get across that open ground and we started to have a real good rhythm about ourselves they started to half of them started to extract and withdraw because we had the upper hand and we had that aggression and we had that you know i don't even know if it's full hardy because when i look back at it now for sure there was someone looking down on us because we were just yeah it was just so close and uh, none of us got hit you know and that's a huge defensive position that we were going in against and we were just very fortunate um to be alive and that's another thing as well you know i tried to explain that in in the in the courtroom that on the way back to where the vehicles were we had obviously medics attached to us a female and a, and a male medic these male and female medic were working on some of these militia fighters who had gunshot wound injuries working on them one was doing cpr and one was putting them in a in a position in a w position to make sure you know there was um he was you know trying to sustain his life and, and keep him alive is for for as long as he could before we got them back so i was just like that because that's what we do yes we war fight but one when, when it's when it's done you know if there's casualties we have to treat the casualties because it's what we do as british soldiers but none of that was like even mentioned in the room they're like yeah whatever we'll skip over that no but why are we skipping over it you know you're on about me you know talking about use of bayonets or you know why was one of the militia fighters engaged 10 times in in his midriff you know and i'm like well they're just questions that i can't answer you you use as much lethal force as you think is is a right lethal force to you know keep you alive and these are militia fighters who have just tried to kill you so i don't like i don't read in any pamphlet say one or two two rounds and then that, that's it that's all you can fire you do what you do to eliminate that threat and if that's five or six or seven or eight rounds then that's what it takes to eliminate that threat it was just I don't know it was just chaos in that courtroom and um yeah it was just it was just tough being in there answering these questions thinking I've just given every single thing that I've got for for this organization being at the British army for for my country you know the Iraq war was unpopular I know that but we don't don't choose to go to these you know foreign fields there's a decision made and we have to go there and when we're in someone else's back garden people don't like it they then become the aggressors and we have to react to it we don't go out there and and become the aggressors we go out there to try and figure out what it is we need to achieve build up rapport with either village elders or local militia and try and figure it out try and calm things down and what can we do to rebuild restructure and put some hearts and minds in the, in the process but it doesn't work like that and and Iraq was you know 2004 especially was was so tough such a tough tour and for have yeah like i said to then come back and then in 2013 be you know stripped of everything within that room it was just a yeah, betrayal yeah on on a level that i think us mere mortals could never understand brian you know i i I get kind of 
you know, I get it a little bit just because of my own experience of being in the military and how quickly you can just be a number in the military, can't you? You know, you, you, you're there as a squaddy putting your life into it and, and literally, I mean, I, I, I can say hand on heart, I put my life on the line for my section. Um, and of course, yeah, describing what, 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 what you've been through, it must but be it's what, like but Chris, it's what we do, isn't it? I mean, when you, it's such a tight belonging, the military, it's such a, an incredible organization that teaches you so much. And if you want to excel within that organization, the world is your oyster. There's, there's, there is no, you know, there's no one going to tell you you can't do that. You can go and do as much or as little as you want. There is so much out there. And when you start to, you know, do your build up training and do all your um, post or pre deployment training, you just grow so close to one another. And um, because it's, it's what we do. We just need to know what makes us tick, what, what, make, what doesn't make us tick, um, what maintains our morale, how the family is back at home. You, know, you get educated in this at such a young age that I don't think any other organiz organization um, does better than, than the military. However, that being said, when it's done, it's done. When your time is done, you know, you said it, a number we've all got a regimental number and that's kind of who, what you stand for so and that's why i think it's so or it is hard for a lot of people when they transition from having a clear direction daily from from daily detail from being in this institution for being told what to do for a, a long period of your life to all of a sudden when you come out to the real world you're like where do, I, where do I start? Because there's a there's an element of loss of identity. Um, there's there's a, a gap that needs to be bridged, but it, you can achieve it. It's 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 this different, you know. And you need to get your head around that. It's going to be different. You can't rest on your laurels. It's a whole new chapter. You know, when I when I decided to go, I took a risk. You know, I was a senior color sergeant, just been selected for promotion to company sergeant major and I could have probably gone to the pinnacle but enough was enough for me it went, once the inquiry hearing came out and I was like I'm done it was a huge risk but I wanted to break away from that organization um, I wanted to start afresh and you know I wasn't I wasn't scared. There's a little bit of anxiety, a little bit. And I was, you know, worried a little bit because I've got family, mortgage to pay. But I just used that as a real bit of fuel for me to, to achieve. And so many people said to me, Woody, you're mad. What are you doing? You've got your pension and you just picked up company sergeant major. I mean, you're mad. What? Why would you even do that? It's like, because I need to and I want to and it's going to be better for my family that I do and it, and to be honest it really has mm -hmm. and that has been a lot of hard work but it just goes to show that and I've got zero education Chris none really I went to school with you know I wasn't the best in school didn't have a lot of um, grades seen the the military as a great opportunity went in there worked hard within that organization done a lot of cool courses went um, on a number of different operational tours, gained so much experience. And then when I broke away, I just tried to use as much as I'd learned to what I'm doing, you know, to current. So, yeah. Was it, was, was that, so just to put um, in the time perspective, were you still serving while you fought these allegations? I went operational during these allegations again as a, yeah as a leader yeah as a platoon sergeant i went done my second tour of iraq yeah crazy and for me it's like um 
cake and eat. Sorry, Afghan. I did, not Iraq. Or did I do Afghan and Iraq? In fact, I did. I done Iraq and Afghan under allegation. Yeah. Yeah, crazy, isn't it? You know, and the thing is, I look when I look back at it now, and the soldiers who were in my platoon, in my company, they could have really said, I'm not going to be working under Woody. I mean, these allegations are all over the place. You know, his leadership ability could be in question. His allegations are barbaric. You know, murderer is the, the most serious of allegations. So I don't know if he's going to be stable. These are the questions that they would be entitled to ask. Mm. Absolutely. But the military were like, it's not, it's a thing of beauty. Come on, your platoon sergeant, you're all over it. You're an, you know, you're an inspiration of men. It's like, flipping hell. Or if I then look back at it in a different way is maybe I could have questioned the chain of command. And I never did. It's insane. Yeah, so, I know. I won't even do a podcast if I've got up and I'm having a bad day. Because I can't yeah. give it, I can't, I just physically cannot give it the, the attention it needs, right? Yeah, yeah. That's just a yeah. freaking podcast and nobody really, no one cares if I fuck it up anyway, right? What you, <laughs> what you were asked to do under, un, under that extreme stress is just, it's, things must have changed now. I can't see. Yeah, they would have now, definitely. Surely. Oh, well, I would like to think so. If you were in a civilian job, you'd have been bundled off on some sort of sickness package. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, you know. Well, you would have. It's you, just... would have put, you would have been put away until the hearing had been done. Mm. You know, till, till whatever was going to, whatever was going to happen with the, uh, with the inquiry. If you were a civvy, you would have been put on gardening leave and wait to the outcome. Yeah. But in the military, I was punching out on operations again. Insane. Twice. Did it... Um, yeah. So while these allegations were hanging over your head, did that jeopardise your MC? Only in my own head, I think. Because I'm very self-critical also. And I don't gob off about the military cross um, because it's in the past. Am I proud? Absolutely. 100%. It was probably other than my kids being born and my marriage. It was, it's definitely up there as my greatest achievement for sure. You know, the whole day was remarkable going into Buckingham Palace gates and, you know, lining up with other remarkable people who have been honoured for, you know, whether it's their time and, and effort within the charity sector, whether it's their sport and accolades and a lot of some military great, um, you know, sort of recognition of hard work. And I was in amongst that. And then to go down that, you know, red carpet, you know, stopping, turning to my left, bowing and then going up to that first step was a, you know, no one can take that away from me. It was phenomenal. But then obviously later on. Can we just clarify for our American friends? So you're, you're meeting the queen. Yeah. So she, yeah, she basically um, pinned the military cross on my chest. Mm. And, uh, and we have, we had a little bit of dialogue and you can see it. I've got, I think a little video on my Instagram and we have, Decent amount of seconds on dialogue, you know. She she said to me, "It's not very often because 2004 honors and awards were far and few between." And she said, "You know, it's not very often I, you know, I get to pin these sort of medals on on people's chests and thank you for what you you know what you did and and when you wear it, you wear it with pride." And it's just a, it was just a very surreal day because I've said it before, I'm just a normal guy, you know, and now all of a sudden I'm in, in, in the palace of my mum and dad and my wife. It's like, what's going on? So it was, it was just, it was class, brilliant. And then, you know, the allegations had come up and 
it was all over the news as well because it was a public inquiry and because it was such a spoken about battle for a number of reasons. Um, it just had the press were fixated with it and it went into Panorama, um, released something and it was called On Whose Orders, which made British soldiers out to be barbaric murderers. And it was unfair, really unfair, but we had to deal with the repercussion from that. And then the newspapers were printing I just didn't deal with any any sorts of favours and it was the first time that I started to get messages from people that I knew and, and a few family asking if what they're reading is true and it just it was so heartbreaking and demoralising and it's just like oh you know just to justify my actions all the time and actually my military cost is just it's not even out on display anywhere it's in in a real subtle location that you can even imagine that it's that it's not as because is there a shadow over it maybe i think winston churchill once said that a medal glitters but it also casts a shadow and for me it's case in point really so i wear it on remembrance for reflection you know it's it, it's a representation of me and the other fellow soldiers who were there that day for sure um, and but just to clarify, Brian, so you were awarded the military cross for your actions on this day. Is yeah. this leading the first bayonet charge in was it twenty five years? Yeah, I mean that's what they that's what they say. I don't know whether that's true because. Bayonet's being fixed is just a normal procedure. Like they said that they, they went on about this in in the um, inquest. And I was like, it's just a standard procedure. When you're conducting CQB, which is close quarter battle, you fix a bayonet. It's just a drill. You know, I never had a bayonet fixed on my weapon system because it wouldn't allow it. I had an underslung grenade launcher. You can't fix a bayonet on that but the other lads, whoever could, would have had a bayonet fix because it's, it's drill. So, you know, I, I can't comment on has it done been done since. I'm not too sure. But trench warfare hadn't happened since God knows when. I mean, this was World War type stuff, getting up over the top and going across open ground like they would have been doing, you know, it, the greatest generation would have experienced so i can definitely say that that hadn't been done and and probably won't ever happen again i know it's a big shout but you know going and conducting a real conventional attack across open ground into a stronghold it doesn't happen um very often and was it textbook as as you're taught in training or, or did did the rule book fly out the window? No, it was, it's very easy for me to sit here and, and, and say it was the perfect textbook attack. You know, we did the basics well, what we were trained as, as young um, private soldiers to then being a Lance Corporal, because I was a Lance Corporal at the time. There was a lot of, um, confusion when they surrendered it was like kind of what's you know what's going on now we need to get a grip of the situation I didn't expect I thought we were going to go in and you know once we you know a word of commands called pairs 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 which you all just go and roll up anything else which is in that position and and kill the remaining fighters but when when they surrender it it changes and there was a little bit of confusion there because all of a sudden there's bodies in and around this trench position that had been hit by all sorts, hit by, you know, 5.56 calibre from the SA-80 that we were using, from 7.62, which our vehicle was using, to 30 millimetre, which you get hit with that, you know, there's going to be not a lot left. And it, this was all over the place. It was the first time I'd really seen that type of trauma. And, um, but I had to kind of suppress that and blank that out because I was dealing with this situation now that there's a lot of dead bodies in around. There's militia fighters who have also left this, this main holding position. 
and uh, and now there's a lot of vocal people who are shouting at us we're trying to calm it down we're trying to you know get a grip of this situation and it, there was confusion um you're, but you're vulnerable in that moment to getting sniped you know, to getting shot in the back huge we're vulnerable with with being in this situation where we'd only trained you know, on exercises to do now, all of a sudden it's, we don't know what is else, else is out there on the battlefield. There's, there's hideous sights, you know, of militia fighters who had been killed, like not just a, a gunshot wound. These were in extreme, you know, can't even explain how bad it was. And then you've got to try and arrest these militia fighters who are going berserk. There's weapons everywhere. All over the front of the trench, there's um, ammunition. And I know I'll go back to my social media, but I've, I've posted a, a number of times on my Instagram of, you know, the, the, I think it was a second position um, with all the ammunition laid out, weapon systems, RPG, still RPG warheads on, on their weapons that hadn't been fired off yet. And um, a, number, a number of other things. So um, that's all on there. And, just yeah so was it textbook i don't think so did we achieve our mission and our aim yeah yeah you, you I, i'm gonna say you're downplaying it somewhat if it's not normal in any scenario in life to hear that those, those immortal words fix bayonets and when you do you you're kind of in the shit, right that's well <laughs> or you're attacking your way out of it, it's... it's yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very it's, brave it's thing. It is close and personal. It is, you know, it's extreme warfare. When you're hand-to-hand -hand fighting, you know, you know that you're in a situation, for sure. However, I still will always say, you know, it's just a standard operating procedure to, to do that. And I'm not going to be none of the wise. I'm not... There's no point me glorifying something or massively bigging up saying yeah you know fixing cold steel and punching straight into it and, and, and smashing it into the malicious chest and that did it happen probably you know but I wasn't concentrating on that because you know it's 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 our job to close with and destroy the enemy these are enemy fighters you know and I can only control what I can see and what I was doing and moving and 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 really under a lot of pressure to do what I'm doing. But yeah, it's it's a weapon system. It's a secondary weapon system that we use when we're conducting close close fighting. So yeah. Gosh, it's um it's just beyond belief, really. And I'll say that in all all just utmost respect to you guys, you know. It's the same in the Falklands, isn't it? When they had to crawl up to the yeah, yeah. Argentinian trenches and it's it's there's that quantity in there as well isn't it about being a service person you know the the oh I'm not not I'm not even clever enough to sum it all up but there's this sense of loyalty the the teamwork the 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 sheer bravery of what some people are prepared to 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 do um and then of course there's the the living with it after and that's a whole nother whole well, that's a whole nother battle yes yeah, a whole nother battle and it's a battle that we're not really educated on on how to to fight and it's different it's it's different pressures it's a different enemy it's a silent enemy um but you know you you can manage it if you want to do something about it and it's down to you as the individual to make that step and um and creating a toolkit you know and going on a bit of a growth journey you know post-traumatic growth is a big thing and to grow from adversity and and really wanting to help yourself to then potentially help others is is really what it's about and that's what i've try to do um and i'm no magician you know i have my own 
problems now and again. And um, I have to manage yeah, my own demons now and again. But I'm in a really good place of, of, of late. Um, I've got, like I said, a great family around me, great network around me. Got a brilliant business. And, um, you know, I've just got to manage when I need to manage. I mean, for me, the highlight in recent months was for sure going on set, you know, and, and watching my life story kind of come together into this motion picture. I don't even know if that's the right word. It's going to be a 90 minute BBC two drama, which is crazy. Are the BBC going to do it justice, bearing in mind their sort of links to the establishment? Yeah, I mean, I I had made sure that any of the battle scenes I had full consultancy control over, which they knew was the right thing for authenticity, for, you know, and it's definitely the right thing. I think they could have went harder on Phil Shiner, but I like what they've done, if I'm honest with it. I really do. And um, they've done it justice. I promise you, it's going to be epic. I mean, how they have... Because don't forget as well, it's... I never knew this until I went through it uh, myself, but the BBC are just the broadcasters. They don't make the film. They, they show it. And, and if they wanted to change everything or wanted to make big changes, then I wouldn't have agree, I agreed to even allow that to be shown. I wouldn't have signed it. So they, like I said, because I've had so many questions, like the question you just said, regarding the establishment, and it's because it's the BBC. But it's the producers which get hold of the story. Then it's the writer that creates this incredible, you know, um, narrative that is then going to be put on set and then you know acted out so when i when i agreed to go with expectation who are the producers i would just loved the two individuals who come to pitch to me i just i really loved their their drive their energy their passion for the story they wanted me heavily involved, which was really important for me. And it was just a great experience to then get Robert um, Jones, the writer who, yeah, he's a, a BAFTA award-winning writer. You know, he, he came in and, and wrote this incredible script. I mean, it's so, it's so different to the book, but clearly the content within the book is in the script but it's so different to the book how they've done it and it's it's pretty epic so we're just around the corner um the trailer is going to be shown soon um and we're looking at spring but i haven't got a tx date a transmission date yet i'm still waiting for that to well i'm still waiting to be told but we're in picture lock now which means that all of the you know, changes and if there's any tweaks and stuff, it's all been done. It's locked. So we're just putting the music and stuff in to the film now. So we're just around the corner. Can't wait. It's going to be epic. And God, knows what, God knows what the fallout from that's going to be. I haven't got a clue myself, if I'm honest. So let's just see what happens. And how has the book gone? Because that was in the last couple of years you released your book. Yeah, 2000, it's actually my anniversary uh, on the 21st. It's a couple of days ago. Um, it super exceeded my expectations. It's, um, it went on to the Sunday Times bestseller at number three. And then uh, we crept up, but I couldn't shift Michelle Obama because she was number one. <laughs> so I was never going to shift her from the top spot, but I can live with that. That's fine. And it's just continued to shift, you know, it's, 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 I'm, I'm really proud of, of the book and the feedback that I've had from it and you know, what people have written about it on Amazon. It's just very humbling and um, yeah, I'm very proud of it. So I think the book may get a second wave 
from what's going to be shown on TV. Oh, um, I, th- I think the so. publishers, yeah, I think the publishers are are gearing up for that. And actually, they've sent me a new cover for it that they're going to be releasing at the same time. So they're, they're gearing up for another sort of wave. But if it doesn't happen, it's fine. I mean, it's I'm just so proud to even get to this point. And uh, it's just been, yeah, crazy, crazy journey with so much emotion, having to show a lot of resilience, um, using the keep attacking ethos on a daily basis and trying to maintain some sort of sanity and positivity at the same time and, and trying to be a dad because there were some situations where it was starting to affect my family and my son was going to school and all of a sudden, you know, the schoolyard gossip was my son's dad was a murderer. And, you know, he'll be in the thick of that. And then he'll come home upset and I'll be asking him what's going on. And he'll say, look, they're saying that you you, you killed innocent people, Dad. And it's like, bloody hell. You know, because for me, you can take chunks out of me all day long. I'll try and bounce back and, and just try and stay positive. But when it goes into the family, that hurts. It cuts deep. And when there's someone so innocent, like my son, to be up against this, it's just like, it was, yeah, it was tough, really tough. Brian, listen, I'm, I'm glad it's all uh, working its way good for you. <laughs> um, I think you thoroughly deserve it, mate. No, I appreciate it. No, thank mm-hmm. you very much. Really appreciate it. Oh, well, it's it's, fi- it's great to finally get to meet you as well. And um, so thank you for that. What what I'll do is I'll put links for your, well, I'll put the link for your website below this YouTube video. And then, um, well, we can have this conversation off, off camera, but, but um, or off record. But yeah, we'll put all the links is what I'm trying to say for your book and your parallel below. And um on behalf of the Bought the T-Shirt podcast, keep attacking. Absolutely. No, thanks for having me on. I know I never take anything for granted. So I appreciate you having me on. And hopefully, you know, it'll be some half decent content for your listeners and viewers. So yeah, thank you very much. Ah, the pleasure's all ours. Thank you, mate. No worries. And to everybody at home, massive thank you again. Big love to you all. Look after yourselves. If you could like and subscribe and I should mention that now we've got our own a parallel. I don't even know if that's the right word, but if you look at the video, <laughs> apparel, is it called? Apparel, yeah. Apparel, there you go. <laughs> I'm, I'm 50, 51 years old. You think I would know that by now, but there we go. That's quality. Ciao, ciao, everybody. No worries.